Hello everyone. Welcome to the Living Coast in your living room. My name is Ashley. I am one of the educators here at the Living Coast Discovery Center. We are so excited that we are able to bring our animals into your homes during this time. We wish you could join us in person, but pretty soon we'll be able to see each other again, right? But in the meantime, we are bringing you all kinds of different interactive opportunities to learn about our native animals that call San Diego and the Living Coast Discovery Center their home. Now, for those of you that are just joining in, maybe you've never seen one of our segments before. We are a nonprofit small zoo and aquarium located down in Chula Vista. We're very lucky to be on San Diego Bay at the National Wildlife Refuge. So whenever we do get to reopen and you're allowed to come visit us again, be sure to come check us out and check out all of our lovely native animals that call the Living Coast home. Now today we're going to be focusing on tide pools and the animals that live within a tide pool. Do you know what a tide pool is? If you do, be sure to comment and interact with us as we love to hear back from you. We love to answer your questions and have you participate while we are creating these videos and interaction opportunities with you. So what is a tide pool? How is a tide pool made? Do you know the answer to either of these questions? Well, a tide pool is what is left behind after the tides have washed up on the shorelines and then pulled back out, leaving behind pools of water in different areas along the shorelines, like rocky crevices or holes. Sometimes even the waves crashing down can dig out some of that sand and make a small little tide pool. Now these tide pools are a great opportunity for many different animals to be able to live in. Tide pools provide habitats for all kinds of different animals. Today, here at the Living Coast, we are actually going to be bringing you two different animals that live inside of these tide pools and call them their homes. They are specialized to living in those tide pools. Now, the first one we're gonna talk about is going to be this one right here. Do you know what this animal is? So this is a sea star. You may have heard it called a starfish before. Starfish is what scientists used to call them, but if you joined us a couple weeks ago on the Living Coast in your living room, you had the opportunity to learn what is a fish. And a sea star does not meet those qualifying characteristics. Do you remember what those are? So there is two characteristics that fish must have to be able to be fish. And one of those was that they have a backbone. Sea stars do not have backbones or any bones at all. Do you know what that animal is called when they don't have a backbone? Animals that do not have backbones are called invertebrates. So invertebrates don't have any backbones, no vertebra. And in this particular case, a sea star doesn't have any bones at all. So marine invertebrates are often animals you can find thriving in tide pool habitat spaces. Now, I'm gonna bring this back up close again and I want you to get a nice good look at it. Check out the type of skin the sea star has here. You can see it's actually really bumpy. It's got different shapes and structures going on to it. It's got kind of like porous areas, really rough skin here. Sea stars belong to a group of animals called echinoderms. Echinoderms is a really fancy way of saying rough skinned or spiny skinned. It's actually the Latin name of the group that sea stars belong to, echinoderm, which literally translates from Latin to spiny skin because of all the different bumps or porous or the roughness of the skin of a sea star. Now sea stars are very unique animals. I was using this one here for you to get a chance to see, which is a different type of sea star. This is a type of okra star than what we have here at the Living Coast, which I'll get to show you guys in a little bit. 
And then I also have this one, which is a little bit easier for me to manipulate, right? So sometimes stuffed animals can be the best teaching tools for you to get a chance to check out sea stars. Now, on the back side of this stuffed animal, it just doesn't really look like much, right? But on the front side, you see these lines running across? These lines are actually going to represent where you would find the tube feet on a sea star. Sea stars are going to use tube feet to be able to move. And when you look at this one, you can see they have those veins is what they look like running down the length of their arms or their rays. That's the same on this one. They have the red going across. In this location here, this is where you would find all of the tube feet for this animal. Tube feet are kind of like suction cups on the ends of all of the sea star's arms, and that's what allows them to be able to move. These suction cups are so strong, it helps them to hold on to the rocky substrates in different areas within the tide pool, so that way when the waves come crashing down on them, they don't get ripped off and sent out back to sea, or to protect them from those predators, so their predators aren't able to eat them. So two feet are very important for those sea stars. They actually are going to have hundreds of them running up and down the length of each individual arm, and that's what allows them to be able to crawl around, very slowly of course, to get a chance to check out their food source. Do you guys want to see it up close? So here in our touch tank here, we have two different animals, but we're going to focus on our sea star first. And right now, you're actually getting a great opportunity to see these two feet in action. So this is a bat star. And you can see it's reaching out and holding on using those two feet. They look like just little suction cups on the edges. They're going to go out, reach up, and suction cup on. They're going to grasp onto the wall, just like they would off of rocks and different things like that. And then they're going to release whenever they're ready to move. It looks like this bat star is actually about to flip itself over, which will be a really cool opportunity for you guys all to get a chance to see. So you can see running along the length of the arm here, they have those tube feet. Again, they're like suction cups on the ends. These tube feet are what allow them to be able to move throughout the water, very slowly finding their food sources. Now sea stars, as you can see, they're not moving very fast, right? So what do you guys think a bat star might eat? Well, it wouldn't be something that swims very fast, that's for sure. So these, these stars in particular are actually going to specialize in eating detritus. Detritus is actually going to be organic material that is no longer living. So bat stars are scavenger stars. That means that they'll find anything that is no longer living and get a chance to eat it. Do you guys see right here in the center? That is actually where the mouth of the sea star is. So that st stomach area is going to be right inside of that. Have you ever heard of how a sea star eats before? Sea stars do this kind of cool but also really gross thing where they take their stomach and they throw it up outside of their mouth and they digest their food outside of their body. Once they're done digesting it, they slurp it all back in like a soup. Could you imagine doing that on your dinner table every night? That would be crazy. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys the other side of our sea star friend very gently just going to wiggle him a little bit here and this lets the sea star know that something is touching it so that way it can release those two feet so that I'm not causing any damage. But this can give you a great opportunity to see the color of this sea star. So again I said these are bat stars and bat stars are very common off of our coastlines in San Diego. Actually they're found all up and down the entire Pacific coast which means you can find them pretty much any time you go out tide pooling. Now this particular bat star is a reddish color, but bat stars come in a variety of different colors, including red, purple, orange, sometimes even a yellowy color. 
and they can also be spotted or modded, so they'll have different spots going across their body. That means that whenever you go out tide pooling, more than likely if you see a star in the tide pool, you're going to find one of these guys, those bat stars. All right. Do you guys have any questions about bat stars or sea stars in general? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and switch and talk about our other animal friend. So this, you might have saw it when we were zooming in. We'll get an up close chance at it in a little bit. This is going to be our wavy top turban snail. I have a couple of the different shells of a wavy top turban snail right here next to me, which give us great opportunity to get a chance to see. So you might have seen this snail when we were bringing that camera up close, and then you can get a chance to see these ones here. So these snails are going to be very different than our sea stars, right? They have a shell to protect their body, but they don't have two feet or have that rougher skin like a sea star does. Snails are going to be in a different grouping of animals. They actually belong in the group called mollusca. Now with these snails, a lot of people get confused on snails and they've heard a lot of different misinformation, wrong facts about snails and how that they get their shells. So what do you guys think? Where does a snail get its shell? Does it go to the store and buy it? Does it grow a shell? Does it just find it in the ocean? Where do these shells come from? What do you guys think? So snails are going to grow their shell with their body. Just like you grow your bones, and their shells are going to get bigger as they get bigger. So as you can see here on my stuffed animal shell here, it's a snail on the inside. But you can see it's got that same swirl pattern as our wavy top turban snail. Not all snails have this wavy pattern, but it can be seen commonly in a lot of different snail species. There are an insane amount of snail species out there. So we're just going to focus in on this one. But snails grow their shells as they get bigger. Now wavy top snails can actually get all the way up to four inches. That's a really big snail. The way that snails are able to do this is they're actually going to use different chemistry from the ocean, whatever chemicals are in there that is naturally occurring in the ocean, they're going to pull different parts of that out. So they use a lot of carbon to build their shell and calcium. Just like we use calcium to build strong bones, snails are going to use that to build their shells. So they grow those shells as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then on the bottom of their shell, what you would find right here coming out is going to be the rest of that sh snail. It's going to be the body of the snail or the muscular foot. That's actually what they use to cruise along the bottom of the ocean floor as they move forward, very slowly moving. Now this muscular foot is also very strong, just like the two feet of a sea star. And it's what allows them to stay suction cup to the wall. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been tide pooling and tried to pick up a snail before, but sometimes it's very hard. Snails are very strong animals. So let's get a chance to check out our wavy top snail up close. So we have our wavy top snail here. You can see his shell, that spiral ancient pattern going on. And you're getting for a really great treat that you can actually get a chance to see both the muscular foot, which is what they use to crawl along the bottom of the ocean floor, as well as its head. So do you see those two long skinny things kind of reaching out and feeling out in front of them? Those are antenna acting out and reaching and seeing what they can find in the water column. Now I can see it from my angle, but I'm not sure if you can see it exactly from yours. Do you see something that looks kind of like a white stock with a little black dot on it? That is actually the snail's eye. And then right in the front, you can see that kind of rounded out patch kind of sticking out. That is the mouth. Now, snails have a different mouth than what a sea star does. They have what's called a radula. Have you ever felt 
a cat's tongue before? It's kind of bumpy, right? So a radula is something that snails have that they use to scrape algae and other detritus off of rocky substrates and hard substances. And they'll eat any of that detritus material off of those rocks and stuff. Now that radula is what they use to scrape it off. So it's kind of like a cat's tongue where it's got those bumps across it, giving it that structure. So that way they can scrape off as much as they can. Now, do you know what snails do when they feel threatened or scared? They will actually pull back into their shell. So not only does their shell help give them their shape and their structure, it also helps to protect them. So when something might be dangerous in their tide pool or they feel like they're gonna get eaten by something, they're able to pull their bodies all the way back into their shell and close what's called the operculum. The operculum is a covering that can actually enclose a snail inside of its shell. And this helps to protect them from desiccation if they are out in a tide pool that has dried up. So that covering comes out right here. They pull their bodies all the way into that shell and then they close it off, kind of like a trap door. This helps protect their body on the inside from any predators that might eat them it's really hard for them to get that trap door open and it helps protect them so if the tide pool starts to dry up because it was a really hot summer day or the tide has the next high tide is a really far distance away sometimes it's not exactly as close as we think it might be and this can cause that pool to dry up and these animals need to protect themselves from drying up because they do rely on water so that they can breathe as well as to help it so that they can move, especially with our sea star friends. They need that water to flow through their body so they can use their two feet as they make their way along. So they'll close themselves up inside of their shell to protect their bodies. Now we talked about the hard shell of the snail and that harder outer skin of a sea star. Both of these are great defenses to help protect them while they're out in the tide pool. But one of the biggest things that sea stars and snails are actually facing is the loss of their habitats as different chemistry is changing inside of that ocean. Sorry, our sea star is sitting on top of the bubbler and it's making additional silly bubbles over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, um, sea stars and snails are actually having a lot of issues out there being able to build strong shells for snails and being able to maintain that cooler water in the tide pool area as it's getting warmer and the ocean is absorbing more and more carbon dioxide as it's entering into the environment. Some really easy things that you can do to help sea stars and snails is just try to reduce your footprint as much as possible. Turning off your light whenever you leave, even if you're just going to the kitchen, turn off the light. If you are unplugging some of your extra appliances like toasters or your coffee pot when you're not at home, your cell phone charger, those are all great easy ways that you can change your carbon footprint and reduce it into a smaller amount. Other simple things are going to be things like bike, bicycling or carpooling to work. Those are all great options too. So we're going to get you a chance to see our sea stars and our snails up close. You can see our sea star here sitting on our air bubbler line and it's basically making additional bubbles on the side there. This bubbler is what provides the oxygen into the water here so that our sea star and our snail are able to comfortably breathe through that oxygen inside of this water area. Hey Ashley, uh, what type of food do they eat? Sea stars and snails are scavenger animals. For these particular species, they are going to eat detritus. So that means they eat organic matter that is no longer living, including both plants and animals. So they'll eat algae buildup that's on any rocky substrates, They'll even eat small fish that have stopped swimming away from them because they can't chase them down. But as you get to bigger snails and bigger stars, that's gonna change. So bigger sea stars and bigger snails can actually be considered carnivorous animals with active predatory skills. But these two in particular, our bat star and our wavy top turban snail, they are gonna be scavengers eating detritus. That's a great question. Does anybody else have any other questions for us?
All right, so we are also going to show you how to make your own craft today related to our sea stars and our snails. So it's super easy. You can make your own sea star or your own snail like I have done here using a model magic or clay or anything you have like play-doh that'll work i used yellow model magic here today and then i decorated it with some beads and some beans so you can decorate it with anything that you have at home doesn't really matter what you use you could even use things like sequins or ribbon if you have it giving your sea star its own lovely shape and size now i made mine pretty big and I tried to give it some pokey skin here too to make it a little more realistic and then use those beans and the beads as well. So you can make your own sea star just like this. Just get creative, do whatever it is you would like. And then you just gotta let it out, leave it down and it'll dry and be ready to go. Now I hope you've had a great time learning about sea stars and snails here on the Living Coast in your living room. My name is Ashley and I'm one of the educators here at the Living Coast Discovery Center. We we'll hope that you join in with us throughout the week as we bring you different interactive opportunities to learn more about our native species that live here in San Diego. See you next time.